I'm John Dowell. I'm the museum supervisor at the Ryman Auditorium, and that's where we are right now. We're in Section 10 at the Ryman Auditorium in Nashville, Tennessee. What is the Ryman Auditorium? It's the best venue you want to come to to see a concert. It's the best music museum, um, and I'm not just talking country music. Uh, it has a rich history dating before country music ever got into the building, ever came here. Uh, the building was 51 years old, had begun as a church and had had a life as a church, as a tabernacle for uh, interdenominational, non-denominational type services. And But from the very beginning, there was always family entertainment, always town entertainment here. Um, speakers such as uh, Booker T. Washington, uh, Helen Keller with her interpreter, Ann Sullivan, has appeared in the building. Carrie Nation spoke on Prohibition. President Teddy Roosevelt, First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, um, Will Rogers, the humorist, Americana humorist, um, folks like uh, Harpo Marx and Bob Hope, Doris Day, um, Jeanette McDonald, Nelson Eddy were all here. Paderewski, Rachmaninoff, Roy Rogers and Trigger, you know, something for everybody. And when the Opry came here in 1943, the building was 51 years old and had a vast history. One of, one of the greatest moments um, that we can tell now, in hindsight, is, is one of the best things that happened here was the great Catherine Hepburn came here and appeared in the play The Philadelphia Story before she went back east to make the movie. So, and then when you start talking about the Opry folks that were here, you start talking about Roy Acuff and Minnie Pearl and Bill Monroe and Hank Snow and Porter Wagner and Dolly Parton and Charlie Pride. Those folks have all played here. Hank Williams. Hank Williams, the, the, one of the neatest pieces of history in the Ryman and with the Grand Ole Opry is that when Hank Williams was here the first time, he did six encores of Love Sick Blues. <laughs> Pretty, not a shabby thing to tell, not a shabby story. And, and uh, with all the attention that Johnny Cash and June Carter have gotten, you know, they met here. And uh, Johnny always dreamed of being on the Grand Ole Opry and, 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 and heard young June as a child and, uh, you know, had a crush on her even back then. And when, so when he came, in his own words, the first time I came to the Grand Ole Opry in 1956, I started talking to June Carter and we've been talking ever since. And, and that was their story, you know, that was really cool. You know, there's the story about um, Hank Williams Jr. being backstage and several of the opera ladies, you know, doing diaper changes and things, <laughs> you know. And, and the stories just roll. Um, one of, as a fan of music, um, I, I see people come and go that I really like and, and there are some that really stand out. You know, one of the ambassadors of the Ryman, a guy who always does a show here every year. In fact, he does, he does his fanfare, his fan club show here during um, a country music festival, what used to be fanfare. And then he's part of our bluegrass series as well as Marty Stewart. And Marty grew up here. I mean, he at the age of 13, he played for Lester Flat and played on this stage. And it's a pretty cool story. And uh, and he always loves the Ryman. He, he always comes back, and, and he's, he's a friend of the Ryman. Vince Gill, uh, Ricky Skaggs, those guys really support, and, and all three of those gentlemen are part of our Bluegrass series. So, you know, the, the, the history, we're making new history. The Ryman is still a, a venue. Uh, four months out of the year, the Grand Ole Opry returns here, November through February. Um, so weekends, Fridays and Saturdays are still Opry. Um, it's really neat. I, I, we discussed earlier off camera that, that I play music a little bit and I'm a big fan of music. So being a former educator and somewhat of a, a history buff and, and a musician, this is a really good match for me. Personally, I've seen some great things here in this past year alone. Uh, we've had Van Morrison and we've had uh, James Taylor recently. We keep adding to the history of players that are here. And then another, as, as I've started to mention earlier, as big a fan as I am of music, I grew up in the, in the time of variety shows, you know, 
uh, Red Skelton and uh, uh, Jerry Lewis would have a show on from time to time and Ed Sullivan, who could forget that, and Milton Berle. But we were Polestar's Theater of the Year in 2003 and 2004, small theaters. At the time, we were the smallest and the oldest to win the award, to be nominated and to win the award. And that's that's pretty cool, you know. We're it, I can't say that we're not proud of that. We're very proud of it, and we strive for that daily. You know, there's been all kinds of rumors and things. Everybody always asks me about the Johnny Cash, uh, the lighting. You know, that, I've heard contrasting stories to that. That 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 in itself makes a great story. Um, one of the fellows that was doing uh, some from New York that was doing some uh, research on Johnny um, and knew Johnny personally was um, he was in the building and we took a walk around the building and, and he told me some things and I told him some and and I had a, you know we we've heard that it was either guitar stand or that it was a mic stand that the lights footlights were kicked out by Johnny Cash. I've heard that they were stomped out by him by his foot. That's what the movie depicts. And yet, I'm not really sure that the movie depicts that he did that at the Ryman, that he just he just did that. He just kicked the lights out. Um, one of the former managers here says that that really didn't occur. So I don't know if he's, I don't know if he's saving face, if he's, if he's trying to uh, rescue the, the uh, phenomenon that is Johnny Cash, and you know, if it happened, it certainly can be under, it's certainly understandable, um, because the, you know I think that in one of his books he credited excess pill use and excess alcohol as the culprit. That's understandable, you know, and it makes a great story, you know. But we try to tell the truth, and that's you know that's that's where your that's where your dilemma is, you know. You know do I tell this great story or do I tell this, tell the truth and be boring? At one time, they did some testing here, and they have told us that we have the second best acoustics only to the Mormon Tabernacle. You literally can hear somebody on stage, the three of us sitting here, if we saw somebody walk up and grab that guitar, and they had a good singing voice, or not, not necessarily a good singing voice, but projected. They wouldn't need a microphone. The mic that you see down there is not live. It's not plugged in. It's simply a prop but they can pick up one of those acoustic guitars and they can sing out and you can hear them just wow. fine and not need a microphone. One of the little tricks I do is when I'm doing a backstage tour, I will yell down to the photographer because it doesn't work in reverse. You have to yell down to the photographer, hey, Art, Gene, <laughs> whomever's down there, how many pictures have you sold today? Tell me that in your normal voice and they'll turn around and go 27 and you can hear it at the back, in the back of section 15 and 16. That's where the backstage tour starts, and the people are amazed. We don't, uh, one of the things I like to do is at the Mormon Tabernacle, they drop a pin, and you can hear a pin drop from the back of the hall. Come on. And one of the things we do is drop a guitar pick, and you can hear it. In 1892, the building was built as a tabernacle, one floor, and it was in the round. Um, when, in, in 1897, a group of soldiers, retired soldiers, asked to meet here as part of Tennessee's centennial in 97. They actually asked in 96. And Captain Ryman from day one had always wanted to have a balcony in the building. He's the man, the riverboat captain responsible for its building. And he, he basically was running out of money and didn't feel like he could do that at the time. He still had a family to support. and. So when these guys came in five years later and asked this, he got citizens in Nashville to help him raise the money, and they built this balcony. When the soldiers left town, they dedicated it to them, and it's called Confederate Gallery, 1897. The balcony went all the way to the back wall on both sides, so that four years later, when the stage was built, up to this point it didn't have a stage, even though they had entertainment here, the stage as you see it, well, it was different than this one, but the stage at that time was built for $750. And as it was constructed, the balcony went across the stage on both sides, and you could actually sit back there and watch a show. When the Opry came here, they had to have a radio broadcast unit. They, the Opry is first and foremost a radio show. 
That's something a lot of people aren't aware of. But it's not just a place that you can come and watch a show. In fact, it's not a place. The Opry House is the place. The Opry, the Grand Ole Opry, is a show. And it's a variety country show. And it's filled with humor and love like you've never seen before. But when it came to this stage, they had to have a broadcast booth. And so they took the broadcast, they took the balcony on this side and they removed the seats on the stage area and they actually built offices back there. And you, you, there were some offices and the recording or the radio booth there as well. And so you can sit on the stage right side, which if you're sitting in the house, it's the left side of the stage, but that's the actors or the singers stage right side. And you can purchase a ticket back there and when you walk down to the front of the balcony, you're so close to the stage, you can hand your autograph book over and the likes of Ernest Tubb or Roy Acuff or Billy Walker would sign it and hand it back to you. 